Once again, Arrow and the Head Show, Lance Velchek and my co-host, of course, The Arrow. John, this is a special day, man. How you been? I'm great, man. I mean, uh, you know, life is rocking and rolling. A lot of things uh, going on at the same time. Can't say too much on the Joe Blow sides because I'm kind of keeping it a bit of a secret. But you do know about my film and uh, break. Yeah, Deadline uh, posted an article uh, today, yeah. I believe, or yesterday. Yeah, yeah, uh, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was really cool. So I've been knee deep in uh, post production on that. Yeah, it's gonna piss some people off, but that's okay. Fuck. So go ahead. Yeah, you know well, what? Ladies, ladies first. Uh, oh, so ahead. okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Beauty before brains. I'll take it. I like yeah, it. that's it. Yeah, beauty before brains. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, go ahead. I think the most important section, something that yeah. we um, look forward to, is drinks. Today, because it's a special occasion, which we'll get into in a moment, I am doing something I never do, which is I usually save a special liquor or something very expensive. And I, I, I touch it once and I usually put it in a shelf and I make sure I don't do it until it's oh. the right occasion. But today's that occasion. Exactly. That's discipline, bro. And so uh, I'm going right back to what I had last episode, which is uh, the Johnny Walker 18. Thank you, oh, my nice. buddy Brad, for the, uh, the going away presents. Okay. So I have been uh, making my own mojitos. And I usually like sit in the sun for like a half an hour every day just to uh, enjoy life. And so I got myself a little something light. Huh? Yeah. What about you? Mm. Uh, bullet. Right. Okay. Well, like you said, it's a special occasion. For those of you that don't know, uh, my good buddy Lance here confessed to all of us that he had never seen Sh Shocker, which, uh, yeah, shocked all of us. Yeah, become mm -hmm. a, a running theme, actually, of, of people going... It was. <laughs> yeah, people telling you to go fuck yourself. Uh, you, deserved it. you deserved it. It was nice. It felt loved. And today's the day, right? You Please tell me you watched a fucking movie. Watched it a few times. To make I, up for all the years? Well, yeah, I, I, I bought it. So I was like, I watched it, I watched a commentary. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I could have seen this a while ago, but I refused to see something classic and not own it. So I was like, you know what? Um, and and the, the problem is, the reason I didn't do this 10 episodes ago, John, the reason this has taken so long is because anytime I, I buy a movie because I love movies so much, I end up just like, I bought like a bunch more. So it's like, you know, and I can't be spending money. I just moved, I, you know, I'm in debt, but I'm glad. I'm glad, I'm actually glad about it. I'm really glad to jump into it. Cheers to my old friend and cheers to the audience and anybody who's listening. Cheers everybody. Hello my friend. Hey. Yeah. Let's have a good time. Let's talk about what should have been a franchise. Shocker. We are here today to bear witness to the execution of Horace Pinker. Now, Wes Craven brings you his greatest creation. Shocker. I mean, I'm sure nobody thought it'd be a huge hit. Nobody thought that Freddy Krueger would become an icon and, you know, spawn sequels. At some point, Bob Shea, uh, who was the head of New Line, did cut in Craven at a certain point, like financially wise, when Freddy started to pop a lot, you know, so he brought him on uh, Dream Warriors. And then, you know, they did, of course, New Nightmare and such. But he lost out on money because he he didn't have a claim on, on the character or the, the money that the sequels would make. So Shocker was kind of like his, OK, I fucked up. I'm going to do it again. But this time I'm going to have, you know, control. And if Oris Pinker uh, you know, would become another Freddy, which was the intent. He would have cash big, yeah, so. And I, I'll say this because I've come at this so late. Uh, I think one of my favorite things to do is is when I, I get to watch like a, something from the 80s or the 90s that I've known of, but I haven't seen. Because without any nostalgia, if, if everything is crystal clear and this is almost more Nightmare on Elm Street than I expected. Because I know yeah. that we've talked about this in the last episode and I actually made a good point when I edited that episode, uh, when you mentioned Shocker, to not really scrubbed through the movie because I didn't want to ruin it. So I would just blindly get a clip that I knew that you're like, you're talking about a girl, I got the girl, you got the guy, I got, I got, I got Pinker, you know? 
Um, but now that I watched it, the amount of dreams, the amount of ghosts, the like the, the Freddy sort of esque imagery and style, it, it's almost hilarious. Cause I'm like, oh, this is, yeah, like a, I don't want to say a knockoff because clearly the guy, it's his creation. But it's, it's his creation. He's not, but, but he's knocking himself off. Yes, yes. It's, it's, um, there's a, that famous story when John Fogarty got sued uh, and went to the Supreme Court because one of his songs sounded like uh, Run Through the Jungle, but he wrote Run Through the Jungle. So it's like, you can't sue me on my own song. You can't yeah. claim that I'm ripping myself off. And I felt like this is exactly that. He, he almost redid his, his album, is how we look at it. Only like he, like he did his own remake, yeah. only he changed it. That's yeah. what shot was. I mean, look, you got, you know, opening a number on M Street, Fre Freddy ding, 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 building his glove, you know, opening a shocker. It's even the way it's shot is very similar. You have the use of dreams. Uh, you have the use of everyday appliances used against, you know, the, the, the heroes or the victims. So Freddy, the phone, you know, I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. Uh, Shocker is the lazy boy chair that comes to life. And you the, know, eye, the eyeballs. And, the like, eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and it's funny because Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy Krueger gets you in your dreams. Horace Spinker gets you through electrical appliances gets you through body hopping. Rewatch it recently. I totally forgot about the body hopping. Like he's possessing people like Fall In or The First Power. It's like everything but the kitchen sink was tossed at that. Freddie had the red and green sweater and the fedora and Oris Pinker had the orange jumpsuit. Go in balls deep. Don't tell dad, get over oh. here. I want to ask this question. Did you like it? I loved it. I, I would say my biggest takeaway is that it was actually not the movie I expected. Like, you know, I've seen the cover as a kid um, and, and seeing like random little things throughout my, my childhood. I always thought this movie was him in that sort of transitional space, killing people, like the, the body hopping, the ghosts. It's an amazing movie that is so totally wild. Like I, I would almost say Wes Craven is not a man to do drugs. And I, after listening to commentary, she sees a very calm, well-spoken man. But this yeah. set feels like a movie made by somebody on drugs. Were your friends? We're not like the others, man. Really? No more of that talk or I'll put the fucking leeches on you, understand? Get in. What I like about this movie and what I took away from my, my, my first or second rewatch was the bizarreness of it. It, yeah. it goes so far, like you said, everything in the kitchen sink. I didn't know that. So, I mean, the body hopping, I knew once you told me in our last episode, but it shifts, like the ghosts come in and then all of a sudden it's, it's an action movie, it's a rock movie, but then it's this drama. It's a love story. Then it's this like weird, cool effects thing. And and uh, Horace Pinker is like a rock and roll character. I had no idea. I I, yeah. I don't know because you just you always said he's like the next Freddy Krueger. So yeah. I thought he's going to be a very stoic man. Maybe a line here and there, a witty line. That motherfucker talks the entire time. It's hard to outrun Ready Kill one asshole. Oh, so you had to bring Daddy up, huh? I give you a show. Looking at Shocker, I love it for exactly the reasons I didn't love it when I first saw it. You look at the first like 35, 40 minutes when, you know, they, they go and hunt down uh, Horace Pinker in the house, the cops are going there and he's, there's televisions with uh, corpses or like lakes, if I remember correctly and stuff. And he's whacking them one by one. And it's unnerving, it's suspenseful, it's dark. He's not a funny guy at first. He's an evil motherfucker, man, he's violent. He's uh, Freddy on steroids, you know? But then after he gets shocked, after he gets the chair and he comes back, they turn him into Freddy circa part four, where he's goofy. I was always disappointed that Mr. Craven didn't keep to the tone of the first act before he gets executed. But today, I, I appreciate it. He just went all, all in, man. All out and all in, all everywhere, man. He said, yeah, fuck it. Let's just rock and roll. And, you know, the soundtrack kind of echoes the, the film itself. You know, it's a rock and roll movie, man. Craven has come out hardcore against the later Freddies. He's like, yeah. I don't, he's too fucking jokey. He, he talks too much. Yeah. Hence why in, in New Nightmare, Freddie said almost nothing, was barely in the movie, and was creepy as hell. And I love New Nightmare, but that's, I know we've talked about him. Some people do, some people don't. A horse Pinker, what surprised me is he was pretty four. And I'm like, yeah. well, what the fuck, man? You, you were so against it. And then you have the chance to create your own character. Not that that's bad, but I remember thinking like, am I supposed to root for him? Because 
he walks that line where I'm like, I know he's evil, but he's so aggressive and and and, and sort of over the top that yes, I find him like I was laughing with him. I was like, ah, you know. Sweet, go, no, go. Shut up. He's stretching his fingers to get into the socket. Yeah. <laughs> he has like, the lazy boy, like everything about him. I was like, oh, this guy's this, cool. What about what about the scene? And that, that was for me the first indication this movie was not gonna stay the movie that it had been, you know, kind of dark and vicious and impressive. When he's uh, in a cell with like TVs and jumper cables or some shit, and there's lips that appear in the air and it's like, you got it, baby. <laughs> like, what the fuck? It is just a weird uh, amalgamation of, of probably everything in his head. And then I, I listened to the commentary. He was going through a real nasty divorce at the time. And he just had this like mean sense of humor. And I was like, okay, that makes more sense. Cause there's a lot of humor in this that I, I almost wondered was either intentional or unintentional. I couldn't tell. Like the little girl that you mentioned in a previous yeah. video is like. So when Pileggi, he got the role by showing up in full on character. He walked into the audition room full on in character and just started fucking raving like a fucking lunatic and doing his pinker thing to the point where the producers started leaning, like going away from him and go hide on, in, in this corner of the room because he was so scary and right away he got the role. But he started, the film started shooting before he showed up. So he was like, you know, they told me I had to get a limp. So I developed this crazy ass limp. And, but the first person they shot that had the limp was the little girl. So the little girl started doing her, you know, drag the foot. And, you know, so by the time he got to set, start doing the shtick, he's like, yeah, I got the limp down and everything. I'm like, no, Mitch, sorry, but little girl established the limp. Now everybody that was getting body possessed would have to do that foot drag. Yeah, the dragging, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. foot dragging limp. So I thought, I thought it was funny. It's a, I don't give a fuck movie. I don't give a fuck. Oh, tones all over the place? Fuck you. Oh, body whopping? Yep. Dreams? Yep. The finale, you know, through the TVs and everything like that? Yeah, fuck you. So he didn't give a shit. Get out of my way, bitch. I need a body. Go back to hell where you belong, Baker. We've been uh, kissing the movie's ass now for long enough. What did you not like? Okay, so this is where it gets a little more complicated because the first thing that comes up when you say flaws of shocker to me is is the dialogue. And again, I can't tell though if it's because I'm watching an 80s movie or it just has that like surface level of dialogue where everybody's kind of, instead of emoting, they're, they're saying their feelings. And then there's a lot of movies in that time period did it. So I can't, I'm not blaming shocker, but like, you know, my, one of my favorite things is the, the cop dad. And I wrote it down because I'm bad at names. So let me get my dad, notes. It's uh, Michael Murphy. Michael Murphy, yes. Yeah, he's awesome. Now, I love him in this, but he's also hilarious because everything he does is so over the top. He has yeah. the long duster and he's always smoking cigarettes. It's just like, yeah, you gotta get out of here, kid. Who is so interested in the doctor all of a sudden, huh? Pinker is dead, John. Go home, get drunk or something. Hey, you get the hell home and let me deal with us. For me, a lot of dialogue was cheesy and that's it, you know? And sometimes you, you watch a movie and you're kind of like, eh, that didn't feel right. So then you think, is it the actor or is it the lines? And in this particular case, I thought it was some of the dialogue was really cheesy, especially from poor Camille Cooper, who's most likely a great actress, although I've never seen her in anything else. I think she retired after this. I think she just oh, yeah. lived, yeah, lived a different life. Yeah. That's what happens, you got a bald guy chasing you around, you know, whatever. Which, by the way, was a ballsy move, man. Just like totally as an aside. I didn't anticipate the girlfriend getting whacked so early. No, and becoming a, a ghost. A ghost. Yeah. I did, definitely did not anticipate that and the necklace uh, stuff, which is probably my least favorite things that a movie is the, the love angle, really. As you said, it, it, it feels surface. So mm -hmm. it feels fake. I don't buy their in love and I love in China. They're like 18 or 17. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Although they're 50. You know, for real, you know, the actors. <laughs> I love the 80s and 90s where teenage, yeah. like 18, 17, they're played by 20, 30s. How do you do, fellow kids? What? You told me off camera a while back, I think you either know or you have some sort of relationship with Peter Berg. Peter Berg, we're not bum buddies or nothing. Um, <laughs> I met him in Washington. It was a thing for a lone survivor. In Shocker, he would tell, he was only an actor. It was actually his first role. And he would tell Mitch Pileggi, one day I'm going to become a big director. And he did it. Peter Berg wound up, you know, directing uh, Very Bad Things, which was his first film as a director, which I loved with uh, Christian Slater. And, but he directed Lone Survivor, which I fucking loved with uh, Mark Wahlberg. 
And they had an event in Washington. They flew me down and everything. And I got to talk with him and I brought up Shocker. Of course, I'm going to bring up Shocker. I'm like, so dude, man, Shocker, man, what the fuck? And uh, we just start, started talking about it. And he had a blast. Everything was a like, big smile on his face, talking about it. And at some point, I'm like, straight up between you and me, would, would you do a Shocker too? He's like, hey, fuck it. He's like, that's oh, awesome. If Wes Craig would come to me for a Shocker too, I'm there. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Good guy, actually. Really, really, uh, really solid dude. Well, speaking of, uh, because this, the tone is so over the place, Mm. Uh, I, I want to ask you, how do you think they would even make this a franchise? And, and The same way Nightmare on Up Street became a franchise, you know, uh, Freddy Krueger's uh, beef is with killing the Elf Street children, which are connected or were connected to the parents that whacked him. His MO goes beyond that. He just likes to kill people. He's a serial killer. Before he gets executed and comes back as this thing and of course he has this thing with jonathan and and all that stuff he's still a serial killer so if i would do a shocker part two i wouldn't connect it peter berg's like the nancy you know of the of the series so maybe he can come back dream warrior style but he's just back and going through you know shit and killing people going through tvs and stuff and killing people just like freddie did with dreams and i know for a fact that uh, mitch pileggi would love to be in a shocker sequel but not as Horace Pinker, because it, the, the role took uh, quite the physical toll on him. And he's an older gentleman now. And yeah. he's like, you know, I'll, I'll play something else, but I, I'd be in it, but I wouldn't play Horace Pinker, which is sad because he's still, you know, that's the thing about bald guys. You know this, I know this, he knows this, is that you age, but you kind of always look the same because your haircut hasn't changed in 50 fucking years. So I guess what it brings us to favorite scenes. Um, and I'll let you start. Because this is something that you're a little bit familiar with. What is your? I got a couple so, things. You know, you know what? There's so many. I mean, uh, you know, right? Even the first time I saw the movie in '89, and it, you know, it opens up with him working on TVs right away. I'm like Elm Street right away. So, but I like that. It's a nice homage. Tells the audience this is what I'm going for. I'm I'm doing another Freddy. And so, so for me as a huge Freddy fan, a huge Wes Craven fan, for him to announce it so boldly out the gate. It was kind of like, fuck. So I still, even now, when I watch the movie today, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. So, you know, that, um, the scene, uh, which I mentioned before, unless we edit it out, uh, where the uh, cops, you know, break in to, to his place, his compound, if you will, with the TV. Yes. And, and I, which I always found really unnerving. Except, hold on. Not, no, pardon me? Now, let me jump in though, real quick. The only, that seems amazing, but the only issue I have is that the, at the end of that scene with the cop on the hood, he's like, and it's, it's cheesy as shit, but everything before that was like, yeah. I bought it. <laughs> I, I bought it. it. Sign, like steel, soul. I liked uh, his, his hideout. I agree with you. It was really cool. I, I wish they like used that more, you know? Of course, the monologue when he gets executed and he talks to uh, Peter Berg, J aka John. It's a Jonathan, by the way. It's not John. It's Jonathan. Oh, I put John. I was just showing. Oh, I don't give a shit. John, so, John, uh, John. Yeah. He's like, you know, when he kind of recounts a story how he came and you know shot him in the leg with that big gun. He's really going for it, yeah. you know, in that bit. So I love that scene. But even when the, uh, I think it's the prison nurse, she gets possessed. I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, want some head or some shit like that. You know, uh, the little girl in the truck, the 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 end fight scene through t TV land. Uh, but yeah, what about yourself? Any uh, scenes that stick out? So the first one that caught me was the execution scene because I think that's when the tone really changed. Like obviously, right yeah. before when he has like the uh, jumper cables and the fucking TV, and that's that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, they have this nerdy prison guard walk by. And it's like ba -ba -ba, it has this really cheesy eighties metal music. I always say like it's um what the I love the what the 80s did best is everything was exaggerated, but they try to make it real. Like it's not Tim Burton-esque where they take a, a scene like a man getting executed and it just is is out there. Mitch Pileggi, as Horace Pinker says, which I like about his characters, he has this like drawl that is there sometimes, not others. He drops it and randomly because th that's the movie we're in. Goes, I used to beat you real good boy. I used to beat you good boy. I was beating you good when your mama tried to stop me with a gun. <laughs> and I was like, all right, cool. Yeah. Man's got to relax, right? At hey, Bernie Lomax, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. It set up what I like about the movie, which is like, okay, 
there's no rules. We're just having a good time. Yeah, we're going and, balls balls in, man. And, and speaking of one of my other favorite parts, and my favorite parts are not what I think of the people would pick. Uh, there's part where uh, Jonathan or John Peter Brook's character comes back after the tussle with the the, sh- the jumping of the bodies, and he goes back to the gymnasium, and his coach basically goes over yeah. the entire plot. It's my favorite thing. He goes like, "Are you saying that Pinker is alive somehow?" And he just jumps in and out of people like a goddamn clap or something. But I love it that they wrote that in. The coach and, is that, just... and that dude sells it, man. He's yes. good, man. And then the last part is jumping through all the, the cool scenes in the TV, which I liked because it's effects wise was probably the, the most convincing. I was actually very impressed yeah. that they did it. But he, they end up in like what I believe to be like the, the middle America. And I'm from the Midwest, so I could I could talk as much shit as I want. I'm not a from the coast here he, they end up in um this this slob of a family it's very like white trash or very like very very midwest and this woman who <laughs> it chips all over yeah, and she has the the uh her, yeah, her, her, her curls, yes. yeah like a caricature of yeah i mean it's clearly uh yeah it, it, the whole thing ugly sh- like green yellow shag carpet a horse banker and and jonathan and john are fighting and they uh, fight into her, her plants yeah. and her trees, and she goes, Wait a minute, that's my oh! tree! So ridiculous because these people jumped out of a TV, I know, are alive, and she cares about her plants, and she's just like, yeah. Ah. Ah, bah, 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 bah. she has like the accent I, I love it i love it. It, it it's actually like probably one of the better scenes and, the, and then they jump into the game show that has timothy yeah. leary as the the host um i mean i think that's a good point of what this movie is and i would like to talk about the music well yeah this is back when movies had soundtracks now i'm talking yeah. about like like a movie would make a soundtrack and i grew up with that stuff yeah. so i would love to i go I, by the cassette yeah yeah i, I have dude series. i have the cassette of the Shocker soundtrack. You know what a cassette is? The, when I was in fifth grade, I went and bought Down the Upside a cassette. I have cassettes. I'm nice. not that young. Yeah, come on now. Yeah, so I have the cassette. Soundtrack was amazing. I, I listed, well, actually, I don't even need to look at my list. Two songs that like come out to me. One of them is called Demon Bell by uh, Toys. What's it called? Dangerous uh, Toys, it looks like. Dangerous Toys. And I always remember the lyrics. I'm not going to sing the whole thing because I'll probably trip on my tongue and make a fool of myself. But it was something like, uh, I was born without a soul inside, so I'm gonna rip out your heart and try and offer size. You remember that shit? I, I remember it in the movie. Hey, fuck you, man. I, I, you're older. This is not my music, man. <laughs> Anyways, I always loved that song since I was like, you know, a teenager. That song. <laughs> yeah, but you did. From the movie, I go fuck yourself. The second song is a song by Bonfire, Sword and Stone. I'm looking at it, yeah. And I just realized what it's about right now. I am the sword, you are the stone. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Good for that. God bless the fucking 80s and the 90s, man. But they would use these childish (laughs) analogies, if you will, to to basically talk about sex. Today, it's like, you know, I got my face, you know, right there in that pussy. You know, they're they're like clean, straight up, you know? But back then, it's a sword and a stone, bro. You know, God bless, man. The closest I get, like uh, Iggy Pop's in here, and I'm a big Stooges guy, yeah. and I love I love Pop. Megadeth, but I don't know shit about Megadeth. I don't know about Dangerous Toys, Dead On, Dudes of the Wrath, uh, Bonfire. I, I'm just Dude not a Megadeth. Uh, did the uh, opening song Shocker with Paul Stanley? Shocker, yeah, yeah. Shocker, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, Shocker, it's, it's, Shocker. So I should also say this: every time I've ever been to a convention, like everybody's in like metal t-shirts, and leather coats, and fucking leather jackets, and I have like a Hawaiian t-shirt. I'm like, who here likes us for weeks? You know, so it's like <laughs> I've, I've never been long anyway but i mean i thought that the music was very appropriate like it made it it made the movie something else like this is a good example of if you just replace the songs in the movie with a a serious score or something else that does change the tone even if the the tone is always over the place i think these sort of like cheesy metal like uh really adds what are you talking about cheesy well, all music's cheesy if you want to go back to it, you know. There's like, nothing but, cheesy about the music and shock. Shaka! I mean, it's my fucking 80s, <laughs> 90s rock, man. See the shadow I'm just saying, I thought that it, it, it was very appropriate. I'm glad they kept it. Now, I don't know if you know this, uh, watching the commentary in the movie, Craven actually regrets using rock songs. He's just like, I don't know if it exemplifies the scene like I wanted to. And it's like, hmm. I, I know, I know, here's the thing. Like, I, I feel a little more conflicted because it's like as a director I, i'm like hey man i get that you created this movie but the music actually probably outlived the movie more than the fucking movie so it's like the music actually made it probably what it is so i wouldn't go, I, I wouldn't go that far i I, th- I think the music no. dates, dates the movie 
Yes, but the movie That's for dates sure. itself. If had an orchestral throughout, then the, the movie wouldn't feel as late 80s as it does. But because he had late 80s rock music, then he really like solidifies. This movie is not, what's the term they use? Evergreen. You know, it's not evergreen, this movie, man. This movie is late, and it's 89, so I'm going to call it 90s, man. It's a 90s fucking horror movie, man. It's a 90s fucking horror movie, 90s fucking rock, man. You, they just cement that time and place. And this, to me, yeah. is, I know you keep saying Definitely. 90s. I, I always feel like late 80s, just because, like, this music is so late. Like, this is 80s music to me. Personally. For me, it's 90s. Well, I, yeah, fair enough. I think yeah. the 90s is like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, but as much as I love the 90s, I do believe there's a course correction that kind of shit on things like this you know like um scream as much as i like it didn't have the balls that shocker had you know no it didn't and and, and you know but the scream was needed you know and i don't want to start another show on this show no scream no was needed yes horror was hard yes so uh, scream kind of brought it back to life in, in terms of closing on shocker uh, i got two things to say the first one is it's better to burn out than fade away i have something to say it's better to burn out than to fade away. Number two, just uh, because I found something online and, you know, I'll send it to you after uh, we finish the show. To reinforce how much they were trying to make um, Horace Pinker the next Freddy Krueger, I found a thing on a heavy metal show where Horace Pinker showed up as Horace Pinker introducing heavy metal music videos. And which is very, you know, parallel to a uh, much uh, more minimal uh, standpoint. And Freddy, who wound up in what fuck Dream Warriors, uh, Dawkin, the Fat Boys uh, yeah. video, uh, Freddy was everywhere. Yeah, that's the only thing from uh, in terms of Horace Pinker that I found of him outside the movie using the persona to promote the film. I mean, Kane Otter showed up on Arsenio. I'm sure England, uh, Robert England as Freddy showed up in a bunch of fucking talk shows. But Horace Pinker, that's the only thing that I found. So yeah, they tried. Is what you're you saying? Know, we're gonna play it for you now. Happy Halloween, headbangers. There's more spine-tingling metal on the way from Annihilator. You're dead meat, Cooper. God, ah, do this! What's the matter, Horace? Don't like my new pinker-proof jacket? So yeah, so that's it. Shocker fucking owns, man. It's a staple of its time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and you know what? I like the original poster better, personally. Yeah. yeah. That's. It's totally well, no, no, that's the cool thing about Shop Factory is that they what they do. Yeah. But they also reverse it. So nice. If you, so if you nice. want to, because I did the same thing with Candyman, where it's like the original Candyman art was better than the, the, the new shit. So because, John, I respect you and this is your movie, I'm going to put the old school artwork into go. the box. That's the way it should be, my friend. Uh, there you go. Now that looks familiar. But everything about Shocker to me was just fun. And it sucks that it doesn't exist, but you know what? Like, I at least get stuff like this now because clearly the, the way the film business is, obviously if it's not independent like you, uh, the shit that gets greenlit is, is so carbon copy and boring. Uh, you know, it's like, I, I gotta look otherwise. Seeing something like this makes me happy. Recommendations, we don't do this every show, but right now, okay, what are, what are films do you think are parallel to Shocker you would recommend to people? I got a couple in my nutsack, but you have any uh, ideas on your own or? So it would be possession and horror. I mean, I guess, no, I, I would go first so I make sure that we're not crossing. Well, the Shocker, there you go. You know, I was waiting for you to have nothing to jump in. Shocker was around the time where there was a people that get the chair and come back trend. So we had the horror show. We had Prison by the great Rennie Harlan, who of course directed Nightmare on Street 4. And Prison starred Viggo Mortensen. You should check it out. It's fucking awesome. One of his early roles. Uh, the horror show which is also known as House, House 3, Three, with uh, Brian James and uh, Lance Henriksen. And sh of course, you know, Nine Run Up Street, and of course, most likely Fallen because of the body hopping uh, element. Time uh, is on our side, right? Rolling was, Stones, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Stones, yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions on your end? Or you just uh, well, I, I do. It's 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 not necessarily in the genre that we want to talk about, but I, I'm going to make a little leap because I think it's appropriate now. One of my favorite movies of all time. and because Deadly Friend? Fucking I, I haven't seen Deadly Friend. No. Exactly. I'm going with Prison. And we're talking about, I know it's a oh, horror. Oh, no escape, baby. One of my favorite movies I've, I've i grew up in i know why you bring this shit up dude mark yes. campbell directed that shit yes and I and... 
Uh, Casino Royale, yeah. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's a, one of my favorite movies. And again, this is from a, a Hollywood video when the, the video store disbanded in like, I don't know, 2003. Uh, I've been waiting for Blu-ray. But the reason I bring this up, and again, I, I'm breaking the rules because I know we always stick to horror, but it's certainly genre. And it's something I do believe would be on air on the head back in the heyday. Pour a little bit of a yeah. drink because... I'll drink straight out of the bottle for Mr. Leota, yeah. Ray Leota, a man's man. I'm talking the epitome of cool. No escape, good fellas, field of dreams, narc. Unlawful entry. Uh, oh, yeah, with Kurt Russell, amazing yeah, Which is like the Ray Liotta buffet, where you see him affable, you see him psycho, you see yeah. him violent, you see him sad. Uh, probably one, one of my favorite 90s thrillers, you know, yes. we had the whole 90s thriller thing. He was fucking amazing. And uh, I, I'm as shocked. Well, I don't know if people are shocked, but I was shocked. And I'm sure you were shocked that he passed at 67 in his sleep while filming a movie. Such a young age. Yeah. And such yeah, a I, fucking awesome actor. Every time he appeared, and no matter what it was, he really would have had the intensity. Like, I, I always say this. We're missing, like, uh, uh, the... the the old fashioned male character. And I don't mean that in a misogynistic sense, but like he had an intensity that I loved where, yeah. where I feel like nowadays it's just not in style. But like every time he showed up, I was like, fucking Ray Liotta. I Even in fucking Copland, man. Yeah, oh, Cop Copland, Copland. He's the tits. Yeah. But don't forget who it was that you came to two years ago to cover your ass. Get him out of here, Freddy. Guys, Lance edits the show, of course. I supervise because he's a little dangerous sometimes, but we're going to drink to Ray and we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about next show. But at the end of the show, you're going to put that good fellas laugh, man. Easy, easy. I'm going to load this up with Ray Leota. I'm just fucking Ray, Ray Leota. Leota in. Man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ray Leota, man. And yeah. I never got to work with him. That pissed me off. Anyways, cheers. Oh, shit. That's rough. Straight. That's when you know fucking, it's like what, the eighth sign of the apocalypse? Ray Liotta the passes. Okay, we're on our way out. Yeah. No, I uh, know. Hi, right, John. So I guess that brings us to, I know we don't always do this, but I, I, I'm feeling generous. What is the next episode? You know what? I'm going to keep with the thematic of films I saw when they came out that I was kind of, eh. But in time, like now, I understand. And there's no movie where I feel that vibe more than Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare by Rachel Talahay. Uh, okay, cool. I'm excited. It is a movie that I fucking hated when it came out. I hated it. But today, eh, different story. So we'll talk. <laughs> Next episode is Freddy's Dead. John? Yeah. Yeah. Until then, my friend, you stay safe, okay? Yeah, and you stay cool. Be good, brother. And cheers to all you guys. <laughs>